high school football, I wanted to be a wrestler. So we joined the wrestling team, and the coach was a uh, good athlete, but he just didn't have the training, the background, but he led him. And somehow he made it to the, to the finals of the state championship. But there he's going to face last year's champion. And uh, the match started, and he was just getting killed. And the coach couldn't watch anymore. He just, but he just covered his face. Then all of a sudden, he heard a loud cheer. And he looked up, and this guy had won. So he ran over to him and said, how did you do that? One second, you know, you're, you're looking terrible, and you're losing. And then the next second, you win. What happened? He said, well, the guy, he had me in some sort of position. I didn't know what to do. And all I saw in front of me was a big toe, so I bit it. <laughs> he said, you'd be amazed at what you can do when you bite your own big toe. <laughs> uh, that's uh, you know, drastic times call for drastic measures. And in Acts chapter 6, the church in Jerusalem was growing faster than anything the world had seen. They went from a handful of disciples to 120 around the day of Pentecost to 3,000 and 100 or more, more than 3,100. Then days later, when the Lord healed the lame man through Peter, several thousand more were saved and added to that group. And when you count the women and children, there were 5,000 men, there were at least 20,000 women and children and men put together. With an organization growing from 100 to thousands and thousands, you're going to have some organizational problems. And it all began with a, a little murmuring. The Bible says murmuring of the Grecian Jews, which refers to, to secret grumbling. They were unhappy. These were the, the Grecian Jews were, were Jews that now they're saved, of course, they're in the church, but they're not from around there. They're the Grecian Jews. They're not from Jerusalem. They spoke Greek. And they uh, came from Greek synagogues when they were Jews. And here they are with this new church that has been born. But they're murmuring because they say, our widows are not being taken care of. You're taking care of the, you know, the Judean, the, the local widows, but ours are not being cared for. And they felt like they were being neglected. They're overlooked, they thought. Well, this was just a growing pain. It was an administrative problem. It was nothing intentional or mean-spirited or, or prejudicial. But that didn't remove the fact that it was real to them. And there were people hurting and people being neglected, they felt. It didn't help the situation that the, they had communication problems because the local Jews, the local ones, they spoke Aramaic. These Greek Jews spoke Greek. Well, the apostle saw the need but also knew that, that they were expected to do something else. And so they told the church it wouldn't be fit or pleasing to God to neglect or forsake the word of God in order to wait on tables. Meeting the, the physical needs of the Grecian widows was a necessary ministry. They weren't arguing that, but it was not as important as preaching and teaching the word of God. We need physical food, but more importantly, we need the spiritual food of salvation. The answer that God led them to would multiply their ministry by involving godly men in ministry. Where before ministry was taking place, but apparently there were people that were falling through the cracks because of busy schedules and communication breakdowns. If you would, uh, we're going to read the scripture now. For, if you would stand with me for the reading of God's word as we look at Acts chapter 6, verse 8. Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the, the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread. And the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. 
In verse 8, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Help us to have open hearts to receive what your spirit wants us to receive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You be seated. So here we see the, the disciples show seven men a good report. That is, they had a good reputation of being full of the spirit, full of wisdom, and full of faith. They were not only qualified by these characteristics, but expected to continue to live in these same ways, godly, committed lives. Most churches don't add to their roles thousands and thousands over a period of days or weeks or months even. But people still fall through the cracks because of busy schedules, because of a lack of communication, communication breakdowns, and sometimes just plain old sin. <coughs> Deacons serve beside the pastor, helping him minister to the needs of the church. And to do this effectively, they must be men that are full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom, and full of faith. So today as we look at this, we have to understand this is not just a requirement of a deacon, but this is a requirement of all of us who are followers of Jesus Christ. We all should be striving to be full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom, and full of faith. Evidence number one is full of the Holy Spirit. There would be obviously be full of the Spirit. And why would the deacon need to be, why would this be required of a deacon? Because a deacon is a spiritual leader in the church, assisting the pastor in ministry to the church. And they need, in order to do the ministry, they need the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit working in them and through them. The filling of the Spirit implies, when it says full of the Spirit, it implies control. If you're full of something, that's what controls you. You look at Ephesians where we're commanded to be filled with the Spirit instead of drunk with wine. Because the wine controls you when you're drunk. It controls you. So instead of being drunk, instead of being filled with alcohol, we're to be filled with the Spirit. So controlled by the Holy Spirit. That meant that the believer is not trying to control his own destiny, but is trusting in God's ability to lead and to use him or her in his purpose. So the first thing, full of the Holy Spirit. Full of the Spirit means that they're not full of this world. They're not full of selfishness or materialism or pride or greed, but they're filled and controlled by God. Now, sometimes we think, well, he should be a deacon because he's a good leader. But that's not what it says. You want someone who is led by the Holy Spirit. Whether they're a strong personality and a good leader, that's great. But that's not the requirement. That's not the characteristic that you're looking for. You're looking for someone who is filled with the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit meant that their goal in life is to be controlled and led by God's Spirit and not their flesh, not their own selfishness, their own will. Full of the Spirit means that they're allowing God to work in them, producing His power in their lives because they're under His control. If we're living the Spirit-filled life, we're not operating in our own strength. We're not trying to love someone with our own kind of love because that runs out, that falls short. That can be selfish and conditional. We need God's love loving through us. We need God's power to love His kind of love. We're not trying to serve God with only our intelligence, but we're trusting Him to use our intelligence, to use our preparation, to use our personalities, to use our experience, with his power to accomplish his will. What we have is, is great. Some people have more experience and more talents and more intelligence than the other person. But without the power of God infused in that, it's, it's so limiting and not enough. We must depend on God working through us and he gives us his Holy Spirit for that to happen. Acts 1.8 the Bible says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so we see that, that when we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive power. And the word there that in the Greek, original, is dunamis, where we get our word dynamite. So it's talking about explosive power. Power beyond what we can do, what we can generate, what we can... Uh, you know, save up for and, and try to be 
energetic. It's not talking about anything we can produce. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that we receive when He comes into our life. So full of the Spirit also means that we're submitting our hearts and our minds and our lives to the Lord instead of surrendering to and, and submitting ourselves to the world. Allowing Him to work in us and to produce in us His fruit. Fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are things that we cannot produce. These are things that are necessary for ministry. So if we can't do it, we need the Holy Spirit to be producing that in us. If you look at Galatians 5, verses 16 to 23, and you see this kind of battle going on, this spiritual warfare going on that's taking place that tried to, to control us. It's like our lives, that, well, that battle is between the flesh and the Holy Spirit. Who are we going to surrender to? Who are we going to... Who are we going to empower in our life? Who are we going to allow access and control? We make that choice every day. We make it all through the day. We make that decision of who we're going to give that access to. Our lives are kind of like a garden, and we decide what's going to grow there. Are we going to let the Spirit grow, or will we allow our flesh to grow? That's the choice that we make, and we make it all day through the day. The Christian that is full of the Holy Spirit is planting the things of God, or he's allowing God to plant his things in our hearts. And then the Spirit is producing his fruit. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, we should be sensitive to the needs around us. We should be sensitive, we should be aware of the revealed needs in our life. In our text, it didn't require a tremendous amount of sensitivity as the Greek believers were complaining, they were murmuring, it was kind of beyond uh, really noticing the need because they were making it known that they were not happy that their widows were being neglected. It's always better when we let God open our eyes to the needs around us. It's always better when we allow His Spirit to make us sensitive to where people are struggling, where they're hurting. But if we don't see it, then there's an obligation to let it be known. You see that? Maybe before they started murmuring, they could have just gone to the leadership and said, our widows are hungry and not being fed. See, they responded in the flesh, and they're, you know, I can't believe them to our women. You know, we're not good enough for them. Whatever. We can't live the same long enough to be cared for. Which is what it is. Uh, if there's a need, we have an obligation to share that need to the body. And trusting that there are people in the body that can stand up, rise up, and meet that need as God provides. I told one of my growth groups the other night, I may have told both, I said, now, sometimes, even though I'm not, we don't have this group, this group's over, I may send a, a text, a group text to you, and tell you about me. I'm not expecting you to do anything if God doesn't lead you. I'm not trying to give you a guilt trip or anything. But I'm letting you know there's a need to pray about and I've done this with other groups, and it's so exciting to see. And someone says, oh, I can help. I've got that. I can do that. Um, and that's what we have to do. Now, they didn't have texting like, uh, in the first uh, century church, but there's still communication that's necessary. So use whatever, whatever you have. Communicate the need, and as a body, we can address it. We can take care of people as God leads us. Um, 1 Corinthians 12, 24 to 26 says, But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. He's just reminding us what we have seen for the last 16, 17 weeks, if you've been here, where we're part of a body. We're connected to each other, the body of Christ. And being connected, everything that affects you affects me, and what affects me affects you because we're connected. And uh, if one member says suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one is honored, all the members rejoice with it. We uh, need to operate that way and being full of the Spirit, led by the Spirit, controlled by the Spirit, it makes the body works so much better. It makes it move in such a healthy way, productive way. Uh, 
And what a blessing it is when the body is healthy and moving together as one. Awareness will lead to action. James 5, 13 to 15 says, If anyone among you suffer, is anyone among you suffering, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful, let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. But do you see how the body's responding to the needs there? You know, they're celebrating with those who have been blessed and are cheerful. And they're, they're praying over and praying for each other, praying for God's healing and forgiveness. See, the Holy Spirit will make us aware of needs. The Holy Spirit will lead us. When we don't know what to say, He will give us the words to say or He'll tell us to clay, keep our mouths shut. And just be there and minister with your presence if we listen to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will convict us to minister to people that maybe we don't really feel comfortable. You know, we don't know them well enough. Sometimes he, he empowers us to get over our comfort issue and lead us to just obey him and, and serve and administer to those who need that ministry. <clears throat> but though the Holy Spirit is working all the time, it's not going to, his work is not going to really affect us until we listen and obey. Sometimes he's working right now. He's, 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 he's putting something in your heart right now if you let him. It may be someone's name, it may be somebody's face, it may be some sin you need to confess. I don't know, but he speaks to us. And when we just turn our back to him and we grieve the Holy Spirit, we reject the Holy Spirit, he doesn't quit loving us, but our heart becomes calloused. And the next time, it's harder to pick up, it's harder to hear, and it's easier to get further and further away from him when we don't listen. So as the Holy Spirit speaks, we need to listen. If we're not sure, we go to a brother or sister in Christ and, and share with them and pray with them and let them help confirm what the Holy Spirit's doing in our lives. In John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you're my disciples. If you have love for one another. You see what he's saying? He's saying, when you love each other, when you love your neighbor, when you love that fellow church member, and you go pray or you take them food or you watch their child or whatever you do, mow their yard, other people see that. And they think, man, that person, that church member loves my neighbor. That church member loves my family member. That church member, they see the love of Christ lived out before them, and it draws them to Jesus. If you have love for one another, all will know that you're my disciples. As we obey the Holy Spirit, as we listen, as we follow His prompting, things will happen, and God will be glorified, and the body will be edified. The second evidence is full of wisdom. Full of wisdom. Wisdom is not knowledge. It's not mental manipulation. It's not just intelligence. And again, all believers should be full of wisdom. So why is it required and expected of deacons? Because they are, again, spiritual leaders of the church, and they should be directed, and they should be guided by wisdom, not emotion, not the flesh, not their pride, not their desire to control or to dominate or to gain a reputation. But God's Word tells us um, quite a bit about wisdom. And in Proverbs, the, the book of wisdom, we see a lot in one thing we see in Proverbs 9, 7, and 12, it says, He who corrects a scoffer gets shame for himself, and he who corrects a wicked man only harms himself. Do not correct a scoffer lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. So the wise man receives instruction. They're teachable. They're, they want to grow. They're not satisfied with being less than what God wants them to become. Give, verse 9, give instruction to a wise man, he will, still, he will be still wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. In verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me your days will be multiplied, and years of life will be added to you. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. If you scoff, you'll bear it alone. 
So, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Having an understanding and a relationship with God, knowing who God is, that He is holy, that He is our Heavenly Father, He's the Creator, He is everything. He's the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. By understanding who He is and appreciating, respecting His authority, having reverence for Him, having a fear of Him, a holy fear of Him, that is the beginning of wisdom. So it begins in our relationship with Him. Wisdom occurs 51 times in the New Testament. Jesus is said to be increased in wisdom as a child. James 1 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach. He gives liberally. He pours it on and doesn't take it back. And it will be given to him if we will ask. And again, this wisdom is born in a relationship with God. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in verse 13. The Bible says, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but with the Holy, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So, the natural man is the man without Christ, the man who's still living in the, the way he was born, who's not put who's not trusted Christ, received Christ as Lord and Savior. And so the natural man does not see these things, these spiritual things. He cannot recognize them. And surely we remember that if we, as a believer. We remember when we could not get a handle on spiritual things. Um, let's say like tithing. Tithing sounds like, you know, unless you're getting some benefit with your taxes, like any other charity, it doesn't make any sense. Why would you give more than what the government's going to... It makes no sense because it's a, that's a worldly understanding. But spiritually we understand that it's obedient to God. It honors God and God blesses us when we tithe. But these things are spiritually discerned, it says. They can't know them because they're spirit. he needs the Holy Spirit to understand. It goes on, verse 15, But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have, listen, we have the mind of Christ. Worldly wisdom is understanding cause and effect. Like, if I stay out late past my curfew, I will get my car taken away. If I come in late to work, the boss is going to do something. So wisdom is learning, you know. When you figure that out, you figure out how to avoid the effect of, of uh, my actions, changing my actions. Now, uh, it's also understanding actions and consequences in this world. Godly wisdom is understanding the causes and effects in the spiritual world. Spiritual insight that can only be attributed by God. We are to be full of wisdom. That is, again, controlled by wisdom. But again, the deacon must be controlled by wisdom, the wisdom of God, not the appetites of man, not the desires of this world, not for his own pride. The deacon must not be known for necessarily his ability to make money. Being a successful businessman doesn't qualify you to be a deacon. It may be he has that ability. He may be a wise and smart person and able to make money, but that doesn't necessarily translate into spiritual things. Or maybe uh, because he's a, he's a good, and he does his civic duty, he's involved in the community. Well, that's great, and we should. You know, when God blesses the money or when we're involved in the community, that's great. But that doesn't necessarily qualify you to be a deacon. It's godly wisdom and being full of godly wisdom. And the third evidence is full of faith. Full of faith. Of course, again, we all need to be full of faith as believers. It's not stated directly in this passage, but it is in chapter, uh, in verse 7, when we see the description of Stephen. Uh, full of faith refers to someone that's obedient to God's Word. They're living by faith, not by sight. Someone with the right perspective on possessions. They see beyond what they have. They see where it came from. They see it as something God has given, God has blessed us with. 
They know that, that all they have is from the Lord and is to be used in God's purpose. And given the tithe is just given back to God, the minimum of what He's given us. Full of faith implies that they live by faith, not by sight. Their faith is in Almighty God. It's not in money. It's not in the budget. It's not about bank accounts and numbers, but their faith, their trust is in the Lord God. They don't think, plan, or live like the world does with its eyes on what we have and what we want, but they're free to obey God even when it doesn't add up or it doesn't make sense because they're more concerned about being obedient than maybe everything making worldly sense. Deacons should be full of the Spirit, full of wisdom, full of faith, because they're leaders of the church and their lives and words are going to either edify and build up the church and point people to Christ or the misbehavior will cause believers to stumble and the lost to lose hope. There was a lady, speaking of faith, a little old lady who every morning she would uh, walk out on her porch and she'd raise her arms and just say, praise the Lord. And uh, she had a Atheist moved into her next door, and just he was irritated every morning. He'd hear her say, "Praise the Lord!" So he started going out there on his porch, and when she yelled, "Praise the Lord!" She said, "There is no Lord." Praise the Lord! There is no Lord. Every day this went on, and one day the little lady in the winter time of the year, she said, "Praise the Lord! Please, Lord, I have no food, and I'm starving. Provide for me, O Lord." Well, the next morning she stepped out on her porch, and there were two huge bags of groceries. And she said, praise the Lord, God has provided groceries for me. And the atheist jumped out of the bushes and said, there is no Lord, I bought those groceries for you. And the little lady said, well, praise the Lord. He's provided me the groceries and made the devil bow. <laughs> little lady, she had a mindset of faith. She looked at her world with eyes of faith. She knew where things came from because she trusted in the Lord. She knew that God had her best interest at heart. She looked at life with these eyes of faith. When you have this kind of faith, when you're full of faith, you're not trusting in your abilities. You're not trusting in your intelligence, your knowledge. You're not trusting in your good works or your experience. You're not trusting in the budget or the finances or the numbers. You're trusting in the Lord. Your faith is in the Lord. You know, uh, that's where it all begins. In our relationship with God, it begins with faith. Yesterday I had to, I was asked to a funeral in Arkansas. I went there Friday, came back last night, and it was the mother of my brother-in-law. And, uh, and I was sharing with uh, the people there that, you know, we all know her in different ways. Her uh, seven brothers and sisters know her as a child and growing up, her husband, who was in the Navy when they met and dated, and you know, he knows he knows her as a young woman that he dated, that he married, they began a family together. He knows her in that way, and, and then her children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren all know her in that way, and friends know her in other ways, but I know her just in the last four years when her, her daughter passed away, and she was my age, and they asked me to do the service, and tragic thing that happened and she really struggled with it so I'd see her a few times after that and trying to encourage her and help her and, and she just struggled and her, her, her health started failing and, and it was I knew her in a dark time of her life. I knew her in a really, really dark and gloomy time. And I know one of the things I tried to encourage her with are two verses, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Where the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. I've been out of touch with her for three years since I've been here, but my sister-in-law sent me her pictures of her Bible where she'd underlined things that she had stuff in her Bible, and, and it encouraged me to see some of the Scripture. And this was one of them, these two verses, there were others. But it showed me that though she struggled with guilt and with grief, she kept coming back to trusting in the Lord. She struggled for, for these last three or four years, but she kept coming back to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your understanding, but on Him. And all your ways acknowledge. Look to Him for everything and everything, and He'll direct your paths. It may be that today, that uh, you know that you don't have that. And so I, I can tell you right now, you can receive 
Jesus Christ as your Savior right now. You just acknowledge, I can't save myself, I can't fix my life, but I know Jesus can. And you put your faith, you trust in Him with all your heart. Invite Him to be your Savior. Invite Him to be your Lord. Allow Him to have your life and He'll make a difference. And He'll give you the gift of eternal life. You can do that right now. And maybe that you're a believer and, and you have prayed that prayer and you've surrendered your life, but you keep finding yourself struggling and you keep finding yourself fighting Him to, to live in the flesh and you keep going back to these bad habits. <laughs> Surrender your life today to God's control, being full of the Spirit, instead of full of your flesh. Or maybe you're not growing as a believer. You've been a believer for however how long and you've stopped growing. You, you don't have